and he'll be joining us uh, from DocuSign, a lead developer advocate. It's been a couple of years. I think we last saw each other in uh, ABI Days Paris. Uh, that's right. Before. That's right. Great to see you again. Yeah, you too. Um, and wonderful talk. You're uh, talking about um, an API with blocks. I'm curious. So that'll be great to hear. Uh, are you able to put your slide deck on so we're able to see? Okay. Uh, you'll be able to see also in the um, stage chat, um, uh, the Larry's been clever enough to add his Twitter handle there as well. So um, if you're going to be tweeting during um, uh, Larry's presentation, feel free to uh, CC him onto your tweet as well, as uh, as well as use the um, use the hashtag uh, API days. Okay, and take it away, Larry. Thanks very much. You can see my slides, Mark. It's all looking great. Great. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's great with you. I'm Larry Kluger, lead developer advocate at DocuSign, and today I'm going to be talking about API Request Builder, exploring APIs with blocks. Now, you've seen some of this on uh, previous sessions, uh, just a uh, couple of slides here to review what I think about as an API explorer. It's a tool for making live calls to API endpoints. Some uh, vendors, some API providers call it an API playground. You can see an example here on the right-hand side. This is from a company called Daily Motion. Here's the URL, get slash videos, and then you can choose what you uh, want to set the attributes to, so unpublished, either yes or no, UGC underscore partner, whatever that is, for the checkbox, and then you run test, and there you go. So what's the benefit of an API Explorer? Most important, I think, is zero to hero. Quickly try out the API without writing a program, without writing a script, without needing to use uh, Postman. You just go for it and you can uh, provide the request and you get back the response and you see what happens. The best quality, I think, is where that you have within the API Explorer typed requests. So that means select boxes, numeric entry as appropriate, check boxes as appropriate, and so forth. Now there's another way to do API Explorers uh, that's also very common, which is where the request, uh, typically JSON, that's the big thing these days, of course, where the JSON is in a text area. And you can see that example here from a different company from their API Explorer. This is the request and this is the response along with up here, the response code. And this uh, format gives some advantages and disadvantages. An advantage is that it's easy to handle an API where the request has an attribute, one or more attributes, where the value of that attribute is in fact an object or an array, or an array of objects, or whatever you need. So in this case, you can see that the amount attribute, uh, it needs to be filled in with an array, same with payment method. So that's good. And so that benefits uh, include, you can just simply copy out the JSON request, put it into your own program, or you can save it and then uh, try it, uh, try a modification of it easily. And uh, as I mentioned, it, as I showed, it, it supports uh, nested objects. But there are downsides. The first is that more thinking is required. It's much easier to make a mistake. If while you're typing away here on this request, if you leave out a quote or a colon or a break or, or a comma or something like that, then you have a problem. You also have to make sure that you exactly spell the attributes as uh, needed by the API. So to me, this is, this is good, but I prefer where it's sort of click and go. So, this issue of JSON requests that have many levels of, of, um, of objects and arrays and so forth, depending on the API, this can become more and more of an issue. Now with this API, this is uh, DocuSign's e-signature API, it's, uh, we've got quite a bit of this. So what you're seeing here on the right is an example request to the e-signature API that, that we have where there's quite a bit of nesting, as you can see. So even though this is a relatively simple API, there's a uh, simple API request, rather, there's six levels of nesting. You can see that where there's, for instance, an array of objects. And here is uh, uh, an, uh, 
with signers, then, then within the signers, there's more sub-objects, things like that. So the problem is that with a text format, there's no guardrails. You know, at this point, I suggest that you're more into the level of programming rather than exploring. So we want to solve this, right? So I want an API explorer that supports click and go, easy request creation, and I want it to be able to cleanly support deeply nested API attributes of arrays and objects. And while I'm at it, I want a lot more. I want it to include API documentation. I want to see the requests as JSON. I want it to auto-program the, the uh, request with, uh, with an SDK in different languages. I want to do pre-built examples with the ability to modify them. I want to save my work for reuse. And I think very importantly, I want the ability to share examples that I've created with the API Explorer with other people. The reason is that uh, many APIs these days are able to build up a user community of developers, often through Stack Overflow or through other, uh, through other uh, products. And these uh, communities of developers can help each other and often do help out each other. And one way of doing that is providing answers to questions and providing the, in fact, the specific example of how to use the API to solve a particular problem. So let's uh, go to something exciting, which is a live demo, and we will see what we've got here. So this is uh, the live demo, current version of the API request builder. And uh, so let's uh, log in here. And we will do that and that. Okay, so here's the API request builder. Let's start on the left. This is the toolbox of the blocks. This is the diagram. This is what we're testing out right now. This is a status window that tells us what's going on. And here's the JSON result of these blocks. So for instance, we can start right away. Uh, by default, the uh, tool comes up with a working API example. And uh, this API example invokes DocuSign for uh, what we call an envelope with a document, with one, one document, with one what we call signer, sign here field, and there we go. And then the response from the API, we can see it right here, which is that signing is complete. I signed the document. Okay, so that's good. So let's look more into this. Over here are the blocks. And so these blocks, each one of these is an object. And the objects are not nested. So the objects are one after the other, which means the first order counts. And it's very easy to modify things. For instance, this is the sign here object, and we can just duplicate it, and we just pop it in there. And I'm going to offset it by a little bit more, say 150. And now when I run it, we should have two places to sign. And uh, it uh, typically works, let's put it that way. And uh, so you'll see that there's two sign here fields. There we go. And uh, we need to sign both of them. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, very good. Now, I said that, that position counts. So for example, if I put this up here at the top, I will get an error. So what is showing this error is that the sign here, which needs to be a sub-object according to the API, uh, doesn't have a place to go. And so that's, that's why we got this error. Now we have uh, control Z to undo, and so we can just fix all that up. That works well. And we've got a lot of other benefits too of this approach. Uh, for instance, these uh, any block, and in many cases, the system knows where it can go. So it can't go down here, can't go here, but it can go there. Also, we, uh, if you just hover over any one of these, these um, uh, objects, and you'll see the shorthand version of the documentation. Now, with the diagrams, we can open them. So I'm referring to these as diagrams. We can open it as a local file, or this is the important part, uh, the opening from a URL. So this is where you enable someone from a developer community to, they can provide an example, put it on a web server, send around the URL, and then it's very easy to open it. And what else? We can reset. Now, we want to have pre-canned examples, and there's many of those. 
and then uh, more can be added. And with each one of these, we can uh, see the information. And when we open one of them, you can see that this, for instance, is a, uh, has more parts to the, uh, to the request. This is also showing us the comment field. And you can add comments to one of these blocks. And so that includes when you're creating an example for someone, if you want, you can add in your comment here and uh, help out the person that you're sending, sending this to. Now, the different blocks, I've got them listed here on the right side. The tabs are used commonly. And so if you wanted to add in a date sign, you would first add, add in the container, and then you would add in the, uh, the various fields and uh, make up your, your request. For uh, a little more obscure parts of the API, there it turns out that this request has many, many objects and sub-objects and sub-sub-objects that can be uh, made use of. And uh, so you can see this complete list there. So what gets produced? What's produced is a JSON, and maybe you notice that this is live. So for instance, right here it says example document, which comes from this one. And if I uh, change it, you can see that it's, it's changing uh, uh, live. And so you can just copy out this JSON if you want to do that. What you can also do is select a different language. So for instance, C Sharp. Now with C Sharp and these other languages, you can download first the actual framework. Those are the ancillary files needed, in this case, by Visual Studio to run a C Sharp project. And then after uh, downloading that zip file with a small collection of files, including the, uh, the documents that are being used, you would then download this, this file here, this example, and then you're able to run it. So that works uh, pretty well, too. Now, speaking of documents, this is the documents that it comes with, and then you can add and upload additional documents for your own testing if you need to do that. And those documents would then get uh, this up, um, this dropdown gets updated with those additional documents. Now, for documenting the tool itself, my current plan is to use videos. People don't, as we've been discussing, people don't like to read documentation. So uh, the idea, there's only one done so far, is to have a short videos, a short one, this is a 20 minute one, have short videos here about different aspects of the, uh, of the tool. Let me check that I've uh, shown you everything. I believe, I believe so. So, then the, um, so this is the tool. And so now let's go uh, back to the slides and, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'll discuss uh, some more what enables this to uh, how, how it works and how it got put together. And how you can try it out yourself. Okay, so goal one is the big goal. And uh, I solved it with uh, four steps that I'll, take you through here. The first, the first part was I decided to use the Google Blockly library. And you saw how we're using blocks to create the diagrams that turn in to the, uh, to the test uh, requests. So the Google Blockly library is from the folks at Google. It's open source. And it's, uh, it's several years old. It's actively being developed. And I, everything that you saw and everything that I've been able to do has been with the, um, the stock version of the library. It's got many interfaces. It's well documented. And I didn't, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't need to uh, change the library source at all. Then the second part is, to de is my decision to use the builder pattern. So that's from the gang of four uh, famous books. And the idea is that while you're creating, uh, the, the idea is that a mechanism, a pattern for creating an overall object is to build it up piece by piece. So that's where we have each of these is a object within the overall object. The create envelope is the overall object. <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, order counts. So what happens is that each block 
affects the nearest prior block that it can appropriately affect. And uh, that took a while to work out that algorithm, but uh, that seems to be working pretty well. Then the next step is to take the blocks and generate a, a program. Now, Google Library is good at that. And when you uh, define each block, you also define the code it will emit to create the output code. And so this uh, output code here from the blocks on the left is what we see on the right. Now, what's on the right, this format of code is sometimes called a fluent program, is, and it's also sometimes called a chained program. And what you can see is that we're creating an object, that's the first line, then we're calling a method of that object, this add locus and this attribute, and that method itself returns the same object, uh, modified, slightly modified by what this method uh, does. And so we can then call additional methods on the object. Each one of these methods returns the underlying object. So including add objects. So add document, this add object call is going to add in a document object. And this is the, this is the attributes, the, the um, scalar attributes of the document object. And then the, this, whole this whole method returns an object. And then we go on and we can add another one. So these, this program, this Fluent program, is created from the blocks. Next, we take the Fluent program, and another piece of software takes the Fluent program, runs the program with, of course, a library as well, and creates the result is a JSON file. And uh, this involves quite a bit of recursion. And as you might imagine, it also involves knowledge of the fact, for instance, that a sign here object fits within a signer object and, and how to do that. And uh, that and the Swagger file is used to define all that, as uh, you'll see in a uh, in a couple of slides. So, uh, in addition to simply uh, the straightforward thing, the straightforward translation, what you may notice, that for instance, uh, here we're adding a signer object, but what in fact gets added is a recipient's object that has an attribute called signers, and the recipient's object only has non-scalar attributes. So I was able to short, uh, do a cut here. There's no need to add the, re to have something called add recipients. Instead, the recipients get, uh, excuse me, the recipients gets created automatically. Uh, same thing here with tabs. So what I'm adding is a sign here tab where you can see that here and the, um, but the tabs got created automatically. As I mentioned, all of this can happen because of the Swagger file. Uh, Yin uh, spoke uh, just a couple of sessions ago about the Open API uh, format. Uh, I refer to it by its original name, the Swagger format. And so the Swagger file for DocuSign eSignature API is, is available, and it defines the API's methods, objects, attributes, types, and very importantly, all of their relationships. We also use it for documentation, as well you can see the documentation uh, when I hovered on a block. Now, in our case, we produced the Swagger file from our platform software. So our platform software not only implements the API, it spits out the Swagger file. You can do it the other way around if you want. The main issue, of course, is to have some level of algorithmic mechanical connection between the Swagger file and your API implementation. Otherwise, they will diverge and you will not be happy. Okay, in terms of auto programming the API's SDKs, the way we do that is at DocuSign, we use the open source code gen software. You refer to that as well. So that produces our SDKs from the Swagger file. And then what this tool does is it uses a recursion to auto program the SDK from the JSON, starting with the deepest leaf nodes. And that's because uh, those uh, deep nodes, uh, those deep leaf nodes here, are going to be referred to later on in the program. So the first thing that we want to create is, a, is an instance of a sign here tab. So that's what this is over here. Sign here tab one is a new sign here tab. And these are the settings. And then the next, notice the bracket. Is, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the bracket. 
is that we are right here creating the list, excuse me, the list object called sign here tabs one. And that list object has one member, which is sign here tab one. So that all works out. I didn't demonstrate it, uh, but uh, if you modify the box, the C sharp program or any other programs also changes instantly. It all works very nicely. So right now we've got the auto programming working for C sharp, Java, PHP, and Node, and um, and these other languages too. We've been able to accomplish all of our goals. Feedback has been very positive. I showed it some develop uh, to some developer customers back when we had in-person conferences and uh, internal reviews have been good too. So let's talk about status. The release is planned for December. Open source version is available today, right now at github.com slash DocuSign. And you that's can right. uh, be certainly interested in your comments. So that's, that's it. And uh, can you, before I, you leave, I before you all um, your attention. Thank you, Larry. Before you leave the leave the slide deck up for a sec, can you go back to um, the GitHub one at the end there? Oh, sure. Uh, let's go, just uh, I think we've moved through that just a little bit too fast. Um, there we go. Yeah. So that's the GitHub link because we're already seeing people in the chat saying this is super cool. It's like a more playful uh, Apollo Studio um, was one comment that we got in. Um, there was one question. If there's a linter in the console, then um, they said that's not much of a problem. I missed the when they wrote this, but it must have been um, when you were talking about something around um, the testing or improving the um, uh, the the queries. If there's a linter in the console, then that's not much of a problem. Or using GraphQL Playground, where you can also supply comments as part of the query language. Would there be so what's the advantages of having a linter in the console? I'm sorry, the, a link in the console? I'm not link, quite sure. If there's a linter, L-I-N-T-E-R, in the console. No, no it, must be, uh, it must have been one of those throwaway asides that you may, I mean, there was so much you covered in what you talked about and, um, there was a lot of jumping around, a lot of really interesting little side pieces. Like it's great for anyone using Blockly to learn that trick around, you know, it, the the order matters, you know, in that sort of thing, you know. And there's there was a ton of those sorts of interesting uh, um, asides that you threw in there. So maybe that um, feedback or that question relates to uh, a, a side comment that you made. But not, not to worry. Um, the uh, you'll be able to look in the chats after this to, to see if maybe um, you're able to respond or otherwise um, uh, I'm sure people when they review your video will be able to um, dig into it even more. There is the, uh, so that was fantastic presentation. Thanks, Larry, really exciting the way you've looked around at explorers and looked around at what people are doing and really thought about how do you um, enhance the developer experience and bring all of the, um, the current trends around that interactivity into making an API really sing. So thanks for your work. I'm, um, I'm, st I'm seeing the uh, comment now or the question from Patrick. Is there a linter in the console? Then there's not much of a problem. Uh, we, we, uh, we don't have per um, the, so, so to me, a linter is a more of a batch program that is checking out your syntax. And uh, you're right, uh, that that can help, that can definitely help out. Uh, one for, but one I for believe the, that there's... That there, might be one for more. the future, that might be for the future um, features to consider then. The, I, right. I will have to ask you to um, okay. uh, leave the stage now, Larry, but um, uh, thanks a lot. You've got your details up here in the, in the stage chat as well. So please follow up with Larry um, and his video will be available next week as I welcome Alan to the, stage to thank you mark take, thank you everybody 